If you follow the right workout, you'll get incredible progress, great results, especially when you combine it with a good diet and lifestyle. Unfortunately, if you follow a bad workout, it can be equally as negative. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the five signs you're doing the wrong workout. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh, before we get into, I guess, the signs, generally speaking, there are good and bad workouts, meaning there's some workouts that's bad for everybody. You know, bad workout programming, these wrong exercises. It's just, just terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, and generally speaking, there's there are things that should be found in, in, in good workouts. But the reason why I'm making this point is even good workouts can be bad if they're if they're used by the wrong person. In other words, the workout has to be good, but it also has to be appropriate for the person using it. Otherwise, it's just it's it's like a bad workout. Well, I'll add to that too. It's sometimes too, a a bad workout still can be uh, effective too, even though it's not optimal or ideal, which is misleading, right? Right. So in there's the short term for sure. Yeah, the there's term. that. There's also that. I mean, if somebody this is the this is one of the I think the greatest challenges of getting people to understand this is. If you were eating terrible, not exercising, and then you go do almost anything physical where you're moving the body, regardless if it's ideal for you or not, and you reduce calories or cut out all this bad shit in your life, like you're going to see positive change in the in the right direction. So convincing somebody or explaining to somebody that this may mm-hmm. not be the best choice for you or ideal for you, uh, sometimes it's difficult, especially when they're in the middle of those results like yeah. you have to i can catch that person after they've come back and they've been like okay they've plateaued yeah they've plateaued or they've injured themselves and or they're just they're metabolically just destroyed like if something bad has happened then then it's like okay my eyes are open now but finding them in the in the middle of that is is tough sometimes that's a good point um so we should define like <clears throat> you know good workouts i guess good workouts first off there's not going to be any good workout no matter how good it is that's always going to be good for you so that's number one. So as your as the context of your life changes, as lifestyle factors change, which they will, even if everything stays the same, you still age. Uh, so that changes. As your life changes, a workout that might be right for you now may no longer be right uh, for you. So good workouts are ones that that fit you, fit your lifestyle, and are appropriate for you. So you feel good on them, you get good progress, that kind of stuff. Um, and again, the wrong application or the wrong workout for you even if it's good for someone else, because this is another challenge. Like you could have a friend who's following a workout, getting phenomenal results and be like, well, it is a good workout. My friend does it and they get good results. Let me just apply it to myself. If it's wrong for you, then it's bad uh, across the board. Right. You know, bottom line. So good workouts uh, <coughs> always have good workout exercise programming, meaning good workouts understand sequences of exercises, sets and reps and how they work and play with each other. They understand, uh, you know, micro cycles, meso cycles. They understand phasing, you know, periodization is would be another term for that. So good workouts understand good workout programming. Programming is just how you put things together and lay it out, right? Bad workouts is just they just slap a bunch of exercises together, and you're just moving. Good workouts tend to use good exercises for the for the goal. Generally speaking, good exercises tend to be the those, the ones you hear about a lot, squats and deadlifts and rows and presses, what they would call the kind of basic uh, compound lifts. Although if you're following a correctional exercise workout, you, you'll see a lot of other types of exercises, but they use good exercises is the point. Uh, there's always a, a, a focus on good form and technique. Mm-hmm. Right away, if you're following a workout program that places other things ahead of technique, like intensity or speed or you know reps, right away you know that's a red flag. This is not a, a good workout. And and they always they, they good workouts understand proper uh, progressive overload. They understand how to take you from here to there and get you uh, to progress. Well, and to your earlier point though too, I think there is a responsibility on the person embarking on uh, this this fitness journey of finding the right appropriate workout. You have to take real inventory and accountability for the amount of stress that you have going on in your life, the kind of schedule you have, the amount of sleep you're, you're getting, the type of routine, like nutrition that you're consuming um, to be able to find the right dose. And, and this is something I don't think a lot of people even realize that's a, that's a huge part of it in terms of being able to match you uh, with that, that, that right, good workout. So you could say all these things in terms of what a great workout consists of, but again, you could you could apply it to the wrong person totally. when, when you're not, um, you know, taking that sort of accountability. I, I would go as far to say that it's minimally do- dosed. 
I think that like yeah. you, you say all the time, Sal, that it's it, it's not uh, what your body can handle; it's what's what's optimal for it. And I think we misunderstand that all the time. I think people look at a workout program and they think, or a workout period, and they think that when they leave it, they should feel exhausted and beat up and just like walk out of the gym just feeling like I crushed it and it's not true at all like mm -hmm. a, a, a proper workout should be minimally dosed I should feel the I should get enough of a workout that I send a signal for my body to adapt and change and respond to that and walk out feeling good if I come walking out where I feel destroyed and I'm doing what just what my body can handle it is not what's optimal. To use another example, it's like medicine, right? Like your 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 doctor gives you a prescription and the dose is the the dose that helps you with the symptoms you're handling. If you if you go beyond that dose and, and you tell the doctor, hey, give me the most my body can handle. <laughs> like, <laughs> like what's the most of this drug I could right. take and not die, right? That would be above and beyond what's optimal. And and obviously what'll happen is you'll get terrible side effects um, and you'll go you're you're not gonna move faster in the right direction. You'll actually move slower in the right direction. So doing what you can tolerate is way over here. Doing what's optimal is way over here. So what you can tolerate is not optimal. You've gone above and beyond what's optimal. And now you're just hammering your body and asking for more recovery, more reserves, and less of a focus on adaptation because now the focus is on healing and recovering. And so what ends up happening with that is you just, you, you get sore and you beat yourself up and then you, you start to feel better and you go beat yourself up again. You never progress. This is when people get confused, right? Because they're like, my God, I'm working out so hard. Yeah. Why am I not progressing the way I should? <clears throat> it's because you're, you're doing what you can tolerate, not what is optimal. Today's giveaway is Maps Aesthetic. To enter to win, leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Now, this episode is brought to you by one of our sponsors, Intera Skincare. So these are peptide-based products that regrow hair. So you can put it on your scalp, regrow hair, or you can put some other peptide products on your face to make your skin look younger. This is cutting edge science. This is no joke. Check them out, get 10% off. Go to interaskincare.com. That's E N T E R a skincare.com forward slash MPM, and then use the code MPM for 10% off your order or 10% off your first month of a subscription. Also this month's sale, Maps Anywhere and Maps Hit, both 50% off. If you're interested, uh, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. So the first point uh, or flag or sign that you're following uh, the wrong workout is you're just not progressing or getting stronger performance wise. Notice I said performance wise. Uh, if I say you aren't progressing and people see weight on the scale go down or up, they may think that they're progressing. Okay. Newsflash. If your goal is to lose weight and you lose weight on the scale, you could also be going backwards because you could be losing muscle. You could be overtraining. You could be underfeeding yourself, uh, beyond what your body uh, would consider optimal. So the scale isn't what I'm looking at when I'm looking at the workout. Now the scale, you know, diet and stuff like that in combination with the workout starts to move when everything's right. But when it comes to just judging the workout, what you should see is progress in your performance. Am I stronger? Can I do more reps? Do I have more stamina, more endurance, more mobility? If you're not progressing in any of those things, especially if it's like the first three or four years of your, of your workout, you know, you know, journey, it's not a good workout. You have to see progress. Wouldn't you say that this is probably the first sign? Like we normally see this before you see the other yes. signs. Yeah. Like, or, or they just stop progressing. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I think that most people will, will stick to the same way or not see uh, progress with their body and continue to do that until the other signs start to kick in. Yeah. Right. I think that this one of the first signs and a good trainer. I mean, if we've done our job really well, when we're, when we're training somebody, is to foresee where these because plateaus are natural and normal. It's part of that's part of the process is for us to have these. It's not like this perfect linear like oh we're just better 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 every single week. So if we do our job really well, we know the common pitfalls and things that cause people to hit these plateaus and are on are constantly trying to stay a, a, one step ahead of that. So if you've been in a plateau and you've been at a plateau for weeks or months at a time. That's not a good sign. No, and, and <clears throat> I'm glad you said that because one of the uh, <coughs> one of the biggest travesties of the of the health and fitness space is we've divorced performance from aesthetics. In other words, uh, it, it, somebody will see that their weight isn't going up on the bar or the dumbbells, or they're not doing more reps, or they don't have more stamina, or they don't improve in mobility. But if they see the scale moving in a direction they like, then they think they're progressing because that's what progress is defined as. No, if you are not 
improving in performance, something's wrong with your workout. Now, of course, there's caveats here, right? Uh, if you've been working out for a very long time, you're not going to see progress in your uh, performance all the time, right? If that were the case, then you know by this point, I'd be able to you know bench press a car. So that's not the case. But in the first few years, especially relatively consistently, like you said, Adam, it's not linear, right? But relatively consistency, consistently on a monthly basis, you should be able to see that you're improving, that you're getting stronger, that your fitness is improving. That is a sign that you're moving in the right direction. If you've plateaued or worse, go backwards, which is oftentimes what people will do is they'll go to the gym and beat themselves up too much and slowly get weaker and reduce stamina and can't figure out what's going on. That is like one of the biggest red flags that the workout is wrong. As a trainer, this is how, unless I was training someone super advanced for, for years and years and years, or we've been training for a long time, when I would have a client in that first three-year period, like that was the, the first sign we got to change the workout. Like mm -hmm. I'm seeing your plateau and you've been plateauing for a while. I know I need to change the workout because it's not working for you anymore. Well, strength really is the only indication that all factors, all systems are working and operating effectively and efficiently. Like you're doing all the right things. You can't really increase strength when, you know, there's a massive deficit in sleep. Or it's really hard to, it's really hard it's to possible with newbie gains who like, you know what I'm saying? Like I made the, the point first month or something. Yeah, yeah. But, but consistently sure. your point is right. It's really, really difficult to yeah. see strength gains and then have not have everything lined and up. That's why we lean on that. <laughs> totally. Uh, the next point, and you, you, you said this earlier, Adam, is you feel worse after your workout than you did before your workout, or you just feel worse generally. So this is like, yeah, I've been following this workout for three months, but my knee hurts a lot. My back is bothering me. Uh, my God, I'm exhausted. I have to go to bed early. I have no energy. I need more coffee <coughs> uh, to keep myself up like this is, or, or even more, if you, before you get to that point, you go into your workout and after you're done, you have no energy to do anything else. Like if you finish your, now if you're in a competition, that's different. If you're in a actual competition where you're pushing yourself, you're going to feel worse afterwards, right? You go do a marathon or you go do some hardcore, you know, jujitsu competition or something like that. Like that's different, but your workouts after your workout, your normal workouts, you should feel energized and better than you did going into them. If you feel worse, then it was inappropriate. It was wrong. And if you feel generally worse, not just the mirror or the scale, Again, but you know joints and how you feel and the beat and all that stuff, then uh, the workout might be wrong. It usually is. This is an important one to hammer home, and, it, and maybe that's because I'm biased because I feel like I struggled <coughs> with this for a very long time, so much that I still have to remind myself of this. I had this habit of feeling like I really need to feel like I got after it uh, in a workout in order to feel like I had a good workout, and it's taken me a really long time to find that balance. If that's not true at all, in fact. If I did a really good job, I have a nice workout. I walk out of the gym or walk out of the, the lift and go, oh, I feel really good. Yeah, I, I could have do done more. more. Yep. Yeah. And I just, that's, it's taking time to make that connection. And it's still taking time to still not revert back to that, those behaviors of pushing to where you're at exhaustion or failure or feeling like you need to crush yep. it or out of breath in a workout. And I think that a, a, a lot of people still tend to gravitate to this yeah. way. And I think it's misleading because it does give that that cortisol dump and that adrenaline rush and you feel like- or a you, sense of accomplishment. A sense of accomplishment because yeah. you overcame this really hard workout. And it's tough to convince someone that, that, oh, that wasn't a successful workout, that you overdid that. We would have been far better off maybe doing 50% of that and you would have seen as much, if not more results. Yeah, well, we've been in such this weird- um, trap like especially coaches in in the athletic world where they try to simulate uh somewhat of like the competition gameplay yeah and so it's like what you can endure uh yeah. is is really what we need to mimic and you know what's nice is that there's there's coaches out there uh like brian kula and and sorts and, and defrancos and everybody else that are really paying attention more to to the stress management and finding they could squeeze so much performance potential out of athletes when the dose is just right and when they're they're performing without you know as much fatigue if if any and this is totally a paradigm shifting thing that you know athletes can become even greater uh if they they walk out of these workouts, you know, where they're energized and, and they're coming back, you know, with this kind of refreshment. Now, do you think that's been perpetuated because in the athletic world, there is some benefit to pre pre mentally for yep. pushing beyond. Yeah. Cause it's and a so, discipline. Right. And so because of that, I think this has carried on for so long in the athletic world 
And then I think that's also what is bleed bleeded over into the general population. Because we idolize that's our, right. Yeah, our, our you see these awesome athletes, athletes who look amazing, do these amazing feats out, uh, on the on the court or in the field or whatever, and you go, "Oh my God, I want to look like that. I want to move like that." Oh, that's how he trains. Oh, I should train this way. And for that person, it's even further from the truth, right? The athlete, at least is getting some sort of uh, you know mindset benefit from that because they actually got to go out and overcome and perform mm. these moments of feeling exhausted and still keep pushing. Where the average person who's a weakened warrior or doesn't even play any sports that's training that way, it couldn't be it couldn't be the more terrible for that. Person. Yeah, but well now I mean especially now in sports, uh, coaches get it or starting to get it, and you're seeing better and better performance slowly, slowly uh, as a result. I mean, look in extreme cases if you look at like. Um, high level operative training, like Navy SEAL mm -hmm. training, they're not training them to get them in shape. Like Navy SEAL training is not like, we're going to get these guys in shape. Navy SEAL training is let's weed out the people who are- they Aren't mentally tough. Mentally yeah. tough. How can we stay calm under extreme yeah. stress? Trust me, at the end of, of their training, at the end of the test, they're not more fit than they were going in. If anything, they're, they're less fit, less able. They just, with, they just endured, right? So you don't want to feel that way with your workouts. I remember for me, I remember- I used to say this, I'm going to war. So I used to talk about my workouts. Oh, I'm going to war. Right? <laughs> yeah, I used to say that. And I remember the, the first, one of the first times I saw significant gains, aside from those early days when you're getting those newbie gains and figuring things out. I remember, you know, I've long plateau. And I remember someone telling me like, don't train to failure on your reps. Like stop, like two reps short of failure. Watch what happens. And I remember the first time I did it, I got stronger week over week. I don't remember how many weeks in a row. And it was like a light bulb. Like, okay, where else am I doing this? And luckily, uh, as a trainer, I was better with my clients than with myself. So I was, I, I, the, I even, I tested it simply because I saw that it was true for my clients. I never trained clients like I trained myself because at least I saw with my clients, this isn't working. We got to scale back. For some reason, it applied to myself uh, until uh, much later. All right, the third uh, sign that you're doing the wrong workout is just joint pain. Like you, like some muscle pain is normal. A little bit of soreness is normal. That'll happen with a workout. Too much soreness, not a good thing. Joint pain should not happen. <clears throat> so what that means is either you're doing the, you're, you're, you're doing the wrong workout for your body. So you can even do a good workout mm -hmm. or one that's written properly. But if you can't perform the exercise with good mobility, control, and stability, and you start to notice joint pain, it's the wrong workout for you. Right. Even if it has the best exercises, even if the best coach put it together, if you start to develop joint pain, you got to figure that out. Don't just push yourself through. Or even sometimes you're, <coughs> you're sort of overriding and you're you're working out with momentum uh, because the intensity you, the demand is is so high. Uh, but you're at that point you're resting on the joint, you know, in certain positions, and you're not muscularly stabilizing properly. And so you're not taking that extra bit of emphasis on staying tight and being focused. Um, you're, you're kind of just getting through the workout. I'm, I'm glad you went that direction with this point because the first thing that came to mind when you had written this down was I actually see this a, a lot of times from a good program, just a good program done Applied too, poorly poorly or done too long. Yeah. Yeah. So like this, this is something that still happens to me in, in my career today, right? I like to think that every program or every workout I do is pretty expertly programmed. I like to think that at least, right? But there's times where I find myself like, oh shit, here's where good programming in the sense of, you know, order, order of operation, exercise selection, amount of sets and reps, all that is perfect. But I've been staying in this phase of training or this plane of motion for too long of a period of time. <laughs> totally. And now this expertly programmed program that I've been following is no longer ideal for my body. That's really tough. This is most common in, in, in my opinion, in the the person that gravitates towards the powerlifting community and the like, like that way because they, they want to train those big, they know the big lifts are some of the best movements, they, the best bang for your buck, the best results in all, all aspects. But then they they fail to focus on things like range of motion, like uh, multiple training in multiple planes, stuff like that that are so important or just moving away from those exercises that you've been doing so consistently, yeah. pushing PRs. And that is, uh, to me, this is, where the joints really start talking. Yeah, what happens uh, in, in that case, um, that's a great point, Adam, is that you you can move in a particular plane of motion with an exercise and you get really strong in it and you just stay in it for so long that the muscles and your body's ability to stabilize you in that position. Or that if you move a half a degree outside of perfect form, which is going to happen sometimes, yes. your body can't deal with it because you, you've gotten so strong 
in this one kind of movement that you move just a little bit, yeah. boom. You the slightest injury. rotation, the slightest lateral uh, stability component there just completely obliterates. You built, the, you built the fastest drag car out there, and now you want to go perform on a, on a race course, yeah. right, where you have to take turns and ups. Or, and you, or you, just didn't, you just didn't reinforce the body, and you hit the gas, and it twists the whole frame in, in, into pieces because right. of the torque. Like, you can totally do this. I, I, I do this all the time. I have, I've had to back out of exercises and work on stabilizing and lateral movements and rotation because I'll see that my 400 pound or whatever lift that I'm doing, yeah, I could do the lift, but my body's talking to me. So there are other things I need to train before I continue to push uh, in this direction. Well, this is when the right workout becomes a wrong workout. Well, and this is also why, you know, the order of the programs that we designed, why performance was the second program to follow up Maps in a Bulk. It was the, if somebody was following Maps in a Bulk and seeing tremendous results, they asked us, can I run it again? We would almost certainly say, yeah, go ahead, run it again. But sooner or later, those joints are going to start yeah. to talk to you and that you need to address the mobility stuff, the different planes of movement. And that's why that, that has to be there. Because sooner or later, I don't care how effective that incredible program is for you, you're going to need to address some of those things. And so it's so important that for the person who is following good programming or seeing great results and their joints are starting to talk to them, <clears throat> that this is typically what the sign is, is that you've been focused so heavily in one plane of motion that your body is starting to let you know. And that the idea is to hear or pay attention to that make an, a, a, an effort to move in the other direction, do something that your body needs. Don't think of it as, oh, I'm going to take this massive step back or oh, now I'm going to train this way. I'm going to lose It's a step mind. forward. Yes, because what will eventually happen is that those that that signal will get so loud an injury normally happens. First time I saw this, I was a young kid. I think I was 19 or 20 and I was trying to get my bench. I don't remember what the number was. I was trying to hit some big number. And I remember I, my shoulder kept hurting and I just couldn't figure out what was going on. I'd perfect my technique and... I learned by the power from power lifters how to do it right, but it just kept. And I remember I saw an ad in a magazine for something called a shoulder horn. It's like a really rudimentary, you know, rotator cuff, uh, you know, external rotation, right? And yeah. I'm like, and it said on the ad, very effective ad, add 10 pounds to your bench in a week or something like that. So of course I'm a kid. I'm like done. I bought it. And I remember I did a few reps. I had like five pound dumbbells and I could feel like, oh, that's where my shoulder hurts. It's <laughs> and then I went bench press yeah. and I did add 10 pounds of my lift in like a week. That was the first time I was like, okay. Now you have to explain that to the audience why why one, that ad was brilliant. Because yeah. they know there's tons of people out there like, like you me, that it. just bench presses, bench presses, and, and does no sort of movements to stabilize that joint yes. at all. And having any sort of instability in a, in a floating joint like that, when you go to do a heavy yeah. moving uh, horizontal press, is going to limit your strength. Right. And so they knew, oh, okay, we just teach these people this little dumb exercise that's going to give them some sort of stability in that joint. Then they're going to see this increase. And it was effective. And they yeah. probably sold a ton of those because of that. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're moving in a particular plane, like there's that movement that you're looking for. And in the case of a bench press, I'm trying to press away from my chest, but there are muscles that are preventing my upper arm from twisting, from rotating. It helped to prevent my shoulder blade from doing funny things or from hiking or going down or whatever. All those muscles have to have enough strength to support the power that I could generate moving forward. And what happens is you get away with it for so long until the strength that you've generated or that you've built moving in one direction is now overcome your body's ability to stabilize. Mm -hmm. And that's when you start to get those nagging joint pain and injuries. And it's like, what's going on? Why does my knee hurt? Why is my back always hurting? I'm doing the right exercises. And it's like, your programming is wrong. The workout is wrong for your body. Even though it might've been the right workout for a long time, that's now not the right workout. Next is, and this one's one of my favorites, is an overemphasis on intensity. If you're following a workout and the goal of the workout is to beat you up, make you sweat, give you the hardest workout of your life. You'll burn see a ton of like calories. This. Burn tons of calories. If any workout emphasizes how many calories you burn or whatever and how hard it is, uh, and the names of these workouts often will say, you know, something like that in there, mm -hmm. then you know that this workout is, uh, is not effective. Intensity is a factor, okay? It's a factor. It's that you can use and manipulate to give yourself better results. Uh, but it's not the factor. It's not the only factor. It's not a button that you can keep hitting. And if used inappropriately, almost nothing will get your body to stop its progress faster than misapplying intensity or overapplying intensity. I, in fact, overapplying intensity, I would say, is one of the number one reasons 
why people don't get good results with their workouts. It's a tool and it's like nitrous. And, and that's why sparingly. the reason why it gets overly used is because it is, it can be very effective when applied correctly, but because it's like one of those things that you do hit a button, you can do, you see an instant re response of, Oh wow, I just got stronger. Oh wow. Look at that. What ends up happening is people are constantly slapping that button. And then you're just, just like you would to a motor. If you had nitrous and you constantly were hitting the nitrous <clears> button, <throat> every time you took off from a stop sign, that engine ain't lasting, but a couple of weeps yeah. and then you're going to be done with that. Or you're going to have to rep repair and replace a bunch of parts on there. Right. The same thing goes with intensity in your workout. It's like, yes, it is a tool. It can be effective, but boy, it's one of those things that you want to you want to use it very judiciously, and you can actually see incredible results and never really push this to its limits. That's the part that I think is so important that I didn't always fully grasp because I read all the same studies that talk about int intensity and failure training and things like that and the benefits of it, and so I adopted so much of that that it became all of my workout. Every time I did any exercise, I always ended on going to failure. Yeah. Well, I think there's this big misconception that people have about like how you actually grow muscle. You know, in, in recovery in general, like people are just confused by the fact that you actually need recovery for all these things to happen that you want, right? And it's, yes, the exercise of a vital components to that, but that's just the stimulus. That's what's, you know, you're, you're, you're teaching your body, okay, there's demand here and this is the environment I'm in, but now I need to build. And the building process is all within the recovery process. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, to take it a step further, recovery, we could break that down into two main things, which is healing and adaptation. And oftentimes both kind of happen simultaneously, but healing is not the same thing as adaptation. Healing is just recovering or healing from the damage. Yes, adaptation is above and beyond that recovery. It's above and beyond healing. So it's like if I scrape my skin and I rub off that top layer, healing would be replacing the top layer. Adaptation would be adding another layer in the protective pursuit, layer. The protective layer in pursuit of, of developing a callus. So if you damage muscle, let's say with the workout, um, you have to heal from that. That means getting back to baseline. The adaptation then is above and beyond that. That's when I get stronger. If you overemphasize or overapply intensity, again, this is very individual because what's too much intensity for one person could be the right amount for another person. It could be too little for another person. And you would be surprised at how little intensity you need to move your body forward. It's basically more than you used to. And you would be surprised how, how great of a variance that is from each individual and at what part of your, at what time in your life. Yeah. And what's happening. I yes. mean, you know, yeah. if your sleep is How off, different you are. That's, this is a, this one, this one is a moving target because even it's never the same, it isn't, it's never the same and it's always changing. And there's so many other variables that play a role in it. Like you, you may be the type of person who can handle all this intensity. And you're like, yeah, that is me. But I'll tell you right now, if you're uh, if you're uh, under caloried and you haven't rested very well for two days, you're no longer that person that yeah, workout. Yeah, I don't give person. a shit if you you were last week. You aren't now because the two days that you had of poor poor sleep and not enough nutrition, like you're no longer on that. And learning to understand that this is a moving target that you're always trying to get it as close to optimal as possible is so important because if you think you're, you can apply the same intensity every single week, every single year of your life, like you're, you're heading the wrong way. <laughs> my goal with my clients towards the back half of my career, when I started getting really good as a trainer was I would want to see them smiling, happy, feeling good when they left the mm -hmm. workout. That's how I knew the intensity was right. If, if I hit a workout where I'm looking at my client and I'm like, oh man, we're only 40 minutes into this. They look like they're dying. <laughs> Oops, yeah. we went way Not too hard. crawling and puking. And, yeah, you know. no, we went too hard. This was this was uh, too much of, a, uh, of an overemphasis on intensity. All right, the last one, and this is a big one because this one kind of connected to the to the, the second point where we said you kind of generally feel worse. Uh, but this one gets affected almost immediately. If you do the wrong workout, your sleep will get worse typically. So that's this is a big, there's a bigger picture here, which is if you follow the right workout, most things in your life should improve. Your attitude should feel better. Energy should get better. Libido should get better. And sleep should get better. If your workout is not so good, you'll start to notice other things in your life get worse. And the first thing that tends to get worse is sleep. So if you're one of those people that's like, man, I had a hard workout. And then it's like, how did you sleep that night? Well, I was exhausted, but restless. Like I, I had terrible sleep. I'm not sleeping good. That's a sign that the workout is probably too much for your body. It's probably the wrong workout. Your sleep should improve pretty quickly or stay the same, but def usually improve if you're following the right workout. It's also so important to what we were just talking about with the intensity because they they go hand in hand. Totally. You have to learn to be able to ebb and flow with the um, amount of sleep and the quality of sleep that you're getting with the amount of intensity. And I just don't think that we put enough emphasis on it. In fact, 
I would make the argument that most people that think that they need to train really, really hard, if they put that effort that they put towards the intensity in their workout towards uh, getting great night's sleep, they would see more results, more adaptation, more growth, I more change that. in their body by putting that sort of effort into their sleep and not even worrying about how hard they're training inside the gym. That's how crazy backwards I feel like we have it as a mm -hmm. society. I would 100% agree with that. Look, if you like the show, we have a guide for you that can teach you about peptides, uh, peptides, new science, GLP-1 agonists are a big category of uh, peptides, but there's lots of peptides out there, ones that help you speed up recovery, ones that improve or boost growth hormone, help you sleep better, et cetera, et cetera. Check out our free peptide guide at MP at mindpumpfree.com. So it's a peptide guide, mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Uh, Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me at mindpumpmedia on Instagram.